All right, welcome back to CS50. This is the start of week one. So it's this week that we dive into actual programming with a, a modern programming language and begin to tease apart some of the, the basic building blocks that, frankly, will carry us through the whole semester. More on, in a, uh, more on that in a moment as to what that means. But quickly, one, you do have a printout today of all of the source code that we'll use today and also on Friday. You'll find that the lines are numbered. So if you've ever heard of a language called BASIC, that's actually a language from yesteryear where you actually, as the human, had to type line 10, line 20, line 30, and then you wrote your code to the right of this. So that was kind of uh, humanity's clever approach to leaving room in case in the future you wanted to add some more lines of code. You could put it between lines 11 and 19. Didn't really uh, scale particularly well. These are just printouts, line numbers. So you won't be writing those numbers there, but I'll often refer to them. Office hours have been in progress. Uh, if you would like to come hang out in either the Quad or Quincy Hall Dining Hall uh, this evening or next evening, do drop by. The teaching fellows will be there with the CAs to just chit chat about the course, help you with your scratch projects, or just generally hang out and uh, spend the evening in more of a communal environment. And then sections. Uh, we will uh, have the sectioning process officially begin tonight around midnight. So check CS50.net's homepage and we will have an announcement there as to how you section. But so that we have some breathing room and we don't start off the semester on too rushed a foot. What we're going to do is not start intimate sections where 12 to 15 students in one TF this coming week. We're going to start those in two weeks' time. And this first week, so this coming Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're going to have super sections led by a pairs of TFs. There's just going to be larger sections for the first week that you're welcome to attend any of those. The locations will be announced. So go to cs50.net slash sections to see the current Google Calendar for that. And then finally, we do have a bunch of sensor boards if you would like to take on the hacker edition of PSET0. But do realize that, as will always be the case, we expect, we encourage almost everyone in the course to pursue the standard edition. So by no means should you feel like you are falling behind or cutting corners by just doing the standard edition. That's meant for most folks. So with that said, we spent, and a number of you have spent already, some time playing with Scratch. And we actually have kept an eye, partly just out of curiosity, on what kinds of of, uh, submissions have been coming in already. Uh, now, not to worry if you think it's a little premature for a little bug sometimes. The mouse stops responding. So let's see if the screen starts responding again. Oh, there we go. All right. So I uh, went ahead and dug up this. So if only for curiosity's sake, only about 10% of the class is submitted already. So here, too, don't worry that you're already behind uh, given how quickly some folks have uh, started submitting. But about 30 people submitted. We found this is slightly statistically interesting. So as might uh, be expected, most of you, many of you are running Windows. Uh, what was kind of interesting is that none of you have uh, gone out and got and installed this brand new shiny operating system by Apple, Snow Leopard. We'll see if those numbers change. Maybe someone back there. So uh, we'll see when those numbers come in. Some of these questions you'll find in PSET Zero Survey are really just for statistical purposes. We'll try to do some fun things with the data throughout the semester. Uh, we don't fundamentally need to know what city you were born in, but it's kind of interesting if we can later visualize that with something like a Google Maps. So uh, don't be too thrown off by those. Uh, if you're worried that everyone in this room has an iPhone, very much not the case. Most of you have, or most of the, you that have submitted already, have a normal uh, mobile phone, which is perfect because it actually means the time uh, Welly Chow, CA, and myself is spent on Shuttle Boy Voice of late will actually get used. Right? It's kind of a retro approach to making an application using touch tone prompts. But uh, indeed, if you call 617-BUG-CS50, that service is now live. You can get out of here quickly to, uh, to the quad or to Mather after class, or it operates 24-7 as well. And coming soon are going to be a whole bunch of other features. So right now, it's just option one for Shuttleboy. But coming soon will be an option for wake-up calls, which we suspect will be uh, kind of useful around midterm time, uh, exam time. We're mildly nervous, because I think this could backfire completely if we uh, only discover bugs the morning you have midterms. But we'll try to avoid avoid that. Uh, coming soon, too, will be dining hall menus if you want to find out what is for lunch today? What is for dinner today? Thanks to a former teaching fellow, Kato Uchiyama. We'll have an option online there for, as well. And then soon you'll be able to find out when the next CS50 office hours actually are. Well, people tend to like where they live. Um, this is a little slide that gives you a sense of where PSETs have been submitted from. Freshmen are kind of slacking, it seems thus far, although Hallworthy and Matthews seem to have some decent contingencies. And then here among the houses, what's striking is that the only house that it's apparently work doing other things this week has been Leverett, uh, <laughs> which 
Ironically, is one of the largest houses, and last year the data was completely the opposite. We had more students from Levered House than any, so perhaps we're now paying that price. So just random fun facts here from CS50. So let's now dive in. So this week and beyond is largely about this language called C. And when you start playing with C, you're playing with a real, a traditional programming language. So PSET 1, which will be released this Friday on the course's website, will have you tackle、uh, something that may be unfamiliar to many of you, this operating system called Linux, and also this language called C. And we'll spend much of the semester on C. What's fun, I think, particularly about this language is that unlike Java and unlike scripting languages that some of you might know, PHP, Python, buzzwords like this, it's really low level. It's just Shy of something called assembly language, which we'll glance at later in the semester. And by that, I mean it really gives you fine grained control over where stuff is going in memory. Like, where in RAM are you actually putting strings and numbers and, and databases and stuff like that? And it allows you at the same time to do really bad things. So many of these exploits that you read about, if you read these kinds of publications or websites that involve websites being hacked. Or servers being taken over by hackers and so forth. To this day, a lot of those compromises are either the result of just stupid mistakes by humans. Or sometimes more subtle mistakes made because the website or the program, whatever it is, was written in C or C or some related languages as well. Because with this power comes, as they say, great responsibility. You can do a lot of damage to your own data, to your own security by coding improperly and not being mindful of certain security issues. And what's actually fun, I think, that as a result about talking about this language for the next several weeks is you really understand just some. Societal issues like that, like why did this website get hacked? How could someone possibly do that? And then what are more intelligent solutions to some of the problems we ourselves will see? So, scratch meets C. So, hopefully, even if you haven't sat down to do piece at zero yet, which is fine, still plenty of time, you hopefully got a sense last week of what some of the basic building blocks are of programming. There's like a statement do this, whether it's say something, think something, move somewhere. There's conditions do this if. The following is true. There's variables if you need to keep around a piece of data. And then we saw some slightly more sophisticated topics like threads, multiple scripts, and events, this ability to send messages from one script to another. Well, all those same building blocks exist in C, as they do in most languages. And even though what you're going to start writing for PSET 1 onward is going to look more like the below and less like the top, it's really the same ideas. And if you take one important point away from today, Realize that you will, when you first sit down to program, maybe for the very first time and most likely would see for the first time, you will make some stupid mistake. And you'll stress over some meaningless detail like, why is my code not working? Why is it not compiling? And odds are it's going to boil down to something stupid like, see that semicolon on line four there? Like, you'll accidentally have omitted that. Or you'll have left off a single quote somewhere or double quote. And frankly, this is one of the reasons we start off the course just last week with Scratch, right? You don't have to worry about such uninteresting minutiae, but realize now that we're going to be programming real computers and we have to be ever more precise. And it's this level of precision, this level of nitpickiness that actually does matter. Because you'll find that a computer will do literally what you tell it to do. And if you don't say semicolon there in this particular language, you're not telling the computer that this is the end of the statement and you're making things ambiguous. So ambiguity tends to be bad in programs, as we will see. So, what are these things going to start? Looking like today? Well, a quick teaser a statement that last week looked like this Oh, hi world, with the little purple block in C onward is going to look a little more cryptic, but at the end of the day, the same exact idea printf, which means a formatted printing mechanism,、uh, oh, hi, comma, world, and then backslash n. I think we said last week, what does that mean? New line. So you have to be even ever so explicit about where you want the enter key to be hit, and backslash n represents the act of hitting enter on a keyboard. So that's what the statement's going to start looking like shortly. A Boolean expression. So this was something that could evaluate to true or false, one or zero, on or off, however you want to view the world. Well, now what used to look like orange and green up top there is instead going to look a little more you know, high school math y, but parenthesis x less than y, close parenthesis. And then if you want to join these things together, We're going to see things like ampersand, ampersand just happens to be the nomenclature in C for the Boolean idea of and. 
And the notion of or, if you want to say this or this, it's not going to be OR, it's going to be a vertical bar, a vertical bar. And it's stupid things like this, too. We'll, we'll inevitably get a, an FAQ this semester, like where is the vertical bar on my keyboard? This is not a character many of you usually use. It's usually shift and above the、uh, Enter key on a typical keyboard, though it varies. So, again, don't get hung up early in the semester on stupid details like this because they are. Stupid and they're intellectually uninteresting. So just,、uh, just accept the fact that this is what, at least initially,、uh, some languages are like. Well, what about more interesting constructs, conditions? If x is less than y, last week we wanted to say something. Else we wanted to say something else. Well, what looks like this nested、uh, puzzle piece construction at left this week onward is going to look like the stuff at right. And again, it's getting a little messier, but it's still basic building blocks. If space, open parenthesis, x less than y, close parenthesis, these curly braces essentially represent what Scratch does graphically by embracing puzzle pieces. Similarly, do you embrace chunks or lines of code with these curly braces?、Uh, printf is again form. Formatted print. We've got some familiar quotes now, backslash n and semicolon. So already this is old hat. Else if, now we have a second branch here, else a third branch. And notice again the symmetry throughout this code. If we open a curly brace, we close it. And things seem to be done symmetrically. So that'll become important as well. So loops, we saw things like forever and repeat some number of times. Well, these two look a little weird at first glance, but at the top right there, we have while one. And this is kind of a, a stupid loop in a sense because while one, well, what does that mean? Well, one is synonymous, so far as we've seen, with the notion of true. So while true, what does this suggest is going to happen with that loop at top right? It's going to go forever, right? Because true is true. It's not going to change. One is not a variable. It's not x. It's not y. It's not foo. It's not bar. It's not some placeholder. It is literally a value of truth. So this is an intentional infinite loop. Now, probably not the best use of an infinite loop here, unless you literally want to write a program that, when double clicked or run at a prompt, just says, hi, oh, hi, ad nauseum, forever. Literally, until the cord is pulled from the computer. So sometimes we'll see、uh, infinite loops are good, but infinite loops, if you can somehow get out of them, and the only way to get out of this is to do the equivalent in Linux, we'll see of force quitting that particular program. And then, to be clear, these are not real programs, just as the left hand blocks don't have that. When green flag clicked block, which started a script last week. These are not complete programs, these are just snippets thus far. We'll see what we need to wrap them in to make them real programs. Now, bottom right's a little more cryptic still, but it's a pattern you're going to get very familiar with because it's terribly useful. For int i gets zero. So this says declare a variable called i, initialize it to zero. Do the following. Uh, so long as i is less than 10. So that middle piece there between the two semicolons says is, it's a condition. So it's similar in spirit to what's in parentheses up above, uninteresting though that parenthetical was. So while i is less than 10, do the following. And then do you recall from last week what plus plus tends to denote? Increment. So the effect in English of this bottom loop is to do what in layman's terms? Print o h i 10 times, right? It's not an interesting program, but again, what's otherwise cryptic looking syntax just gets a very simple job done. And so that will become now a new building block. Well, what about variables? Well, this、uh, snippet of scratch code at top declares a variable called counter. It initializes it to zero. And then apparently, this scratch code forever said the value of counter with that little cartoon bubble on the screen. And then it changed counter by one. And we said last week that's the equivalent of plus plus. So that、uh, loop up there, that scratch construct, Has the effect of counting from zero on up. Well, how do we implement that same idea in C? Well, it's going to look a little something like this. To declare a variable in C, we shall see,、uh, will be、uh, relatively as simple as saying, what kind of variable do you want? I want an integer, aka int. What do you want to give its name as? Counter. What do you want to assign it a default value of? At, uh, gets zero, so equals zero semicolon, declares a variable called counter. It says, I'm going to put an int inside of this thing. What int? I'm going to put zero inside of it initially. Now, this loop we saw before, while one means do this ad infinitum, print f. Now, this is a little interesting, and we'll look at this more this,、uh, today and on Friday. Percent d. This is what the f is in printf. When we say printf, it means print a formatted string. Well, what does it mean to format a string? It means to tell the computer, display this value somewhat differently based on what type of value it is. Now, this is kind of an uninteresting case because what do we want to print? Just that value of counter. 
because I want to essentially implement the scratch thing up above. So percent %d henceforth, decimal, stands for integer. Put in integer here. What integer? Well, put whatever integer is inside of the variable that comes after the comma. So, again, basic building blocks.、Um, you're certainly welcome to take little notes on things like this, but it will recur so frequently that this will very quickly become all tat. And finally, counter plus plus. That simply means increment that counter and do it again. So we have scratch, we have C. Functionally, they're exactly the same. I think you'll find in week zero and for PSET zero, it's just a lot more fun to get something up and running using the approach up top. But we're gonna, you're going to run, some of you, into You know, sort of ceilings with Scratch. Things you just can't really do because it's not expressive enough of language. We'll be able to do much more powerful things with C,、uh, much more powerful things with PHP and with JavaScript. So we are on, as you shall see, an upward trajectory. And finally, we had this thing called an inventory. What program was it last week for which I used an inventory? Yeah, it was that RPG, the role playing game where I moved the little guy up, down, left, right, and collected fruit and then presented it to the guy at the counter. Well, I was putting fruit into an array, aka a vector, aka a list, although technically we'll see the semester, those actually have different、uh, useful meanings. In Scratch, we just have a variable called inventory. We can add a string like orange. And when I say string, incidentally, this is computer science speak for a sequence of characters that represent a word, a sentence, whatever.、Uh, so that's Going to be represented in C, perhaps most cryptically still, as char star inventory open bracket size close bracket semicolon. And we won't spend much time on arrays this week, but in C, because you're so close to the hardware, so to speak, because you have so much control over RAM and where the computer puts stuff, you have to be more explicit in C than in Scratch. You have to say, I want an array of what size. Well, you tell the computer by way of this bracket notation how big you want the array to be. So size is actually a variable or some constant value that must be defined somewhere else in my program. It's simply not on screen. But then when you want to put something at a specific location in an array, the ith location, we'll say, I'll stop using finger quotes today because all these terms are new, I'm, I'm sure. So,、uh, so the ith location in inventory is expressed with inventory bracket i close bracket gets or equals and then whatever value. I want to put in there. And now notice I'm trying, even today, here, this、uh, day zero of week one, to be careful with terms like equals, because we'll find that this equal sign that you're familiar with from algebra in most programming languages is not equal, it's not equality, it's assignment. It means take what's on the left and put it inside of the thing on the left. Wait, take what's on the right and put it on inside of the thing on the left. And that's why we've seen this pattern already. So, this begs an interesting question and, and invites an interesting bug. How do you compare two values? If x equal to y, well, you can't say x equals y because that would seem to put y's value in x. So, hopefully, there will be a solution to that. So,、uh, with that said, here comes C. When you write a C program, as I did on the fly on my Mac last week, recall that I opened that little terminal window. It was this little blinking cursor. I quickly rip, whip,、uh, whipped up the code, the source code at top left there, and then I ran a command. A little trivia what was that command? Dude. GCC. So, this is a term you will not forget after terms end because you're going to be running it every day、uh, that you're tackling problem sets. GCC is a compiler. A compiler is a program that takes something called source code and turns it into object code. Now, what does that mean? Well, nicely enough, this course is not about writing stuff. Like this. There was a time, and there, were, there are people still roaming this campus who had to essentially write programs at the level of zeros and ones. Or if you've heard of this thing called a punch card, very similar in spirit. And there was a time where the science center was a center of science.、Uh, you would go into the basement, you would hand in your punch cards, and then the person running the, the mainframe computer in the basement of the science center would essentially run your homework for you. Overnight, because it would usually take a while, by literally putting a stack of cards somewhere into a machine. So, not the most efficient process. And I've talked to、uh, current faculty who you know, grew up this way on a particular campus. Not the best time of day to find out that your program is buggy. It has some mistake in it, right? Because that's probably happening at 9 a.m. the next morning when you go back to this center of science and pick up the results of your program, and it's just one big error message. So, fortunately, we've come a long way, and all of your fighting with bugs and implementing cool things will happen much more interactively within seconds in front of your own computer or the lab computer. But the process is essentially still the same. At the end of the day, the end of the day a computer, whether it's a PC or a Mac, 
Mac or whatever you guys own at home, it only understands zeros and ones. Now, the world has done some really clever things with zeros and ones, but you still have to turn your programs into zeros and ones, and a compiler. Does exactly that. You'll be writing stuff that looks like this at top left. You'll run that file, which is really just a text file, through a program called a compiler. And that compiler will take care of the task of turning it into zeros and ones like this. So, where do you do this? Well, on last week, I went ahead and ran this program. So, just a quick show of hands that we'll have the data for sure. How many of you have Macs in the room? All right, so that's actually statistically kind of a lot. So it looks like more than half of you in the room this semester, and that's pretty consistent with terms past. What's neat is that all the stuff we're going to start doing this week and beyond, you actually could have been doing on your own computers, your own Macs. All this time. Now, terminal is not a program that's usually in the little dock here、uh, as it is in mine because most users don't need to know or care about this little terminal. But you may at least know anecdotally that Mac OS these days is based on an operating system called Unix. And back in the day, Unix was essentially a command line interface. CLI is the buzzword there. And this means you don't double click on icons to run programs, you don't go to pretty menus that have sub menus and graphical icons and all of this fanciness that develops. Over the years, you, if you want to run a program, you type the name of the program and hit enter. And if you want to influence the behavior of that program, you provide it with command line arguments, words or numbers after the program's name, and then hit enter. If you've ever seen DOS on a computer back home, it's very similar in spirit. It's usually a black screen, white text, and you can't do much of interest with it unless you know what's there underneath. So you're not going to write, for the most part, programs in this course on your own Macs or on your own PCs per se. Because it's, it's, a, it's quite hard for us to standardize the configuration of 300 plus people's laptops. So instead, what we do is provide everyone with a uniform environment throughout the semester. Initially, this is a cluster of servers called、uh, nice.fas.harvard.edu. And this nice cluster does so happen to live in this very idyllic building here. So it's in the basement, unfortunately, the cluster of servers.、Uh, it's also a bit of a misnomer because nice, new, instructional. Computing environment has been nice for about 10 years now, and there isn't even an old version, so they've kind of painted themselves into a corner here. We're, we're using the same nice cluster as always. So, nice.fas.harvard.edu. It's not a website. It's not something you type into a browser, but it's going to be the name of a server that you access by way of your own Mac or by way of your own PC. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of you these days have college.harvard.edu addresses, but you also have these so called FAS accounts. And these are the usernames and passwords you use to log into the basement of the Science Center, kiosks, and all of that. Frankly, it'll be a few more years, I think, before the university converges on just one account. But for now, you have these accounts, though they're of decreasing utility. But、uh, for this course, at least at the start of the semester, we do acquaint you with、uh, nice.fas.harvard.edu because what it means is that after this semester, you'll actually still have a Linux server environment on which you can run and write code, whether it's for you know, an economics class in the future or, or a chemistry project or anything where you need the ability to write programs and you're not in CS50 anymore. You'll At least have this resource for some number,、uh, for a good amount of time.、Um, what we will start using mid semester, though. This is the extent of my Photoshop ability.、Um, we will use the so called cloud. So, this is another one of these buzzwords these days. Cloud computing refers to the ability to rent server space somewhere out there on the internet. You don't know or care who or where the servers are or who is running these servers. So, we're essentially going to implement the same idea. CS50 has its own cluster of servers now in the computer science building called Maxwell Dworkin. We've got a couple of really big Dell servers that have a whole lot of CPUs, 32 gigabytes of RAM. Inside of them, six terabytes of storage space. So we can, we can hold our own against HCS here. We have a couple of those. We have an Apple X serve. And long story short, all of this stuff is wired together in such a way that soon this semester you will have your own account on cloud.cs50.net. And what this will mean is、uh, you'll start using at some point this cluster instead of nice.fas, but it's really the same thing. Now, what do I mean by cluster? In the basement of the Science Center and also in the basement of Maxwell Dworkin, there's a bunch of computers. They're all networked together using Ethernet cables into a thing called a switch. They are exposed publicly on the,、uh, on the internet. 
by way of IP addresses or these names, nice.fas.harbor.edu. And there is this illusion that when you connect to one of these servers, you're connecting to just one. But in fact, there's like six computers in the nice.fas cluster, but they've set them up in such a way that you, the user, don't know or care which particular one you're on because your files are all visible on the same, on any one of those machines. And all of the commands are identical across the same. So when it comes time to tackle pset one, what you're going to do if you're a Mac Person is something like this. I just ran the terminal program. I'm going to type a command called SSH. This stands for secure shell. And this just means make an encrypted connection between my laptop, wherever I am in the world, and this server. And so what I'm going to do is type SSH, nice,、uh, let's do mailin at nice.fas.harvard.edu, enter. I'm going to get a prompt then. Looks like I am indeed connected to Harvard University servers. It's asking me for a password.、Uh, fortunately, it won't show you on the screen what the password is, but now I'm at the so called blinking prompt that these days no longer blinks. But blinking prompt it once was. So I apparently have three unread messages, which has been some time since I never checked this email account anymore. So mailing it nice. And then there's this thing in parentheses. Well, this is the command line, so to speak, where you can type anything you want. None of these, well, that command was found.、Um, <laughs> And this is where initially we're going to be writing things like C source code and compiling it. So, what does that mean exactly? Well, this, I'm going to do the following just to give you a sense of some basics. And all of this, realize, will be repeated in problem set one's own PDF. So, your hand will be held certainly early in the semester. So, you needn't try to memorize or scribble down all these commands. But just to give you a sense of what we're doing here, if I type the command ls, this is list. This means list the files in this directory, this folder. Well, there's nothing there. So when I'm at this prompt, it's equivalent conceptually to being inside of a folder on your own Mac or your own PC. It's just graphically very underwhelming. And it's more mechanical at the keyboard than it is mouse oriented. If I want to make a directory called CS50 for the duration of the semester, MKDIR is make directory. Back in the day, people didn't like to write long commands, pretty reasonable. So it's just MKDIR CS50, hit enter. Nothing seems to happen. But if I type ls now for list, notice, aha, there's a directory. As Is implied by the slash there that's called CS50. Well, I can't, unfortunately, it's a little blue on this screen here, but that indeed says CS50. If I type ls, notice that I can't, and this is kind of a neophyte mistake, right? Can't really double click and nothing really happens there. So you have to change directory, cd, into CS50 and then hit enter. And now my parentheses, this is just a special feature of the way we've configured your accounts, you'll see. This just reminds you where you are, which is nice when you start to have lots of. Folders open. Now, if I type an ls here, there's nothing here. So, if I want to write my first program, I need to open a text editor. And the text editor that will encourage most students to use is this little program called Nano. If you've ever used Notepad on PCs or TextEdit on Macs, this is like the most user friendly text editor you can find. But as such, it's also lacking a number of useful features, as some of you with more experience will see. So, let me go ahead and write hello.c. Notice that I have just a simple window. It's a little cryptic at the bottom, but again, this is just stupid stuff that once you know it, you kind of never forget. The caret symbol means hold the control key. So we'll get to that in a second, but let me go ahead and recreate really quickly what I did last week. So I type this cryptic sequence of characters, include stdio.h in bra-、uh, angled brackets. I then said int main,、uh, int argc, char star,、uh, char star. Delete key is not working. We've got to fix that. Well, that's interesting. Wow. All right. I'm going to do this again without making any mistakes. <laughs> Standard io.h int main int argc char star. Here comes argv brackets parenthesis open curly brace one, two, three, four, print f. And I'm just going to say hello. Comma world. I'm going to make it look pretty at the end with the backslash n, close parenthesis, semicolon, close. OK, a y we're not going to indent properly because I can't. Well, here we go. Close brace. So that's my first C program. And this is the thing we completely underwhelmed you with last week. But what does this mean I'm going to do now? I'm going to hit Control X because down here it said caret X for exit. So now it's saying save modified buffer. This is the unuser friendly way of saying, do you want to save your changes? I hit Y for yes. It then checks what do name do you want to give this file. Again, it's just reminding me what it's already called in case I want to change it. I hit Enter and voila, I'm back at the prompt. But if I now type ls, what should I see? 
hopefully hello.c. And this time it's all white because it's not a directory. So now I need to run this thing. So I could try doing hello.c, or again, the newbie mistake of, right, that's really not going to do anything. Hit enter, permission denied. But that makes sense because what's inside this file? This is not zeros and ones clearly. This is just source code. So, source code is the human readable form of this stuff. But I remember from last week, GCC, hello.c. Let me go ahead and hit enter now. Nothing seems to happen, but wait, ls, interesting. Again, foolishly named default name for a program. Anything like hello.exe would seem a little more reasonable. But a.out is this sort of standard, but we'll be able to override that soon. So, a.out has an asterisk, which just means. I am executable. I have zeros and ones inside of me. In fact, if I get a little adventurous and now open a.out with nano, nano being a text editor, a.out being a binary file, binary meaning just zeros and ones inside. So that's the program I wrote. Now, here's two where you can do very bad things very easily. If you so much as hit like, the space bar accidentally as you're flailing about in the basement of the Science Center trying to fix whatever problem you just created, right, you just inserted. ASCII characters, random text, into what's otherwise a binary file. Why does this look so cryptic? Well, nano is again a text editor. It doesn't know, it's not supposed to show you zeros and ones. It's supposed to show you the letters and the numbers and the punctuation that those zeros and ones represent. So when you see all this crazy stuff on the screen, that's just nano's misinterpretation of what's really zeros and ones, not necessarily ASCII letters. Fortunately, Control X will save me here. Save modified buffer. No, the Time. So I hit N, I go back to the prompt, and now I can run a.out just by typing this command here. And in fact, that's my first repeated C program. So that's it. That's the basic building block of writing a C program. Hopefully, we can do much more interesting things than that, but that covers the basic workflow. Now, just to give you a sense that what we're doing in this course is ultimately pretty much uh, operating system agnostic. Here we have Mac, here we have PC, running Mac OS, running Windows. On the Windows world, it's not quite as easy as going to a terminal window because Windows does not ship with. That little program called SSH, with which I created the secure connection. But there's plenty of free tools that do that. One thing you'll see on the course's website is a program called Putty. So if you're a, a PC user, you run a program like this. It's a little more user friendly, if overwhelming, with all of its options. What I'm simply going to do here is say, you know what? I want to connect to nice.fas.harvard.edu. So if I were doing this for the first time, I would simply do something like that. Typing in its host name or its IP address. Now I'm going to go ahead and click. Actually, I'm going to cheat and load something there so I get the bigger font size. I'm going to click open, and now I get this black window again. I'm going to log in as Malin. I get a similar prompt. Enter. Notice I'm back in here. If I type ls, there's CS50, CD CS50. Aha, there's my a.out program. Same exact thing. So this is actually powerful. Even though I'm on a PC here or a Mac over there, I've accessed the same account. So that's one of the upsides of having this central server. You'll be able to access your code anywhere. If you go home on break, if you get sick, if you're just hanging out at friends, you can access your code in this course from any computer on the internet. And you'll find that, for better or for worse, to be at least useful. So just to give you a sense of what else you can do on a typical Linux server, so the machine I connected to, nice.fas, it's running at Linux. Which is again an operating system that's largely text based, but there are GUIs, GUIs, graphical user interfaces. And in fact, if you head to the basement of the Science Center someday, as you might for office hours, they've got like 33% Linux computers in the basement there. They do have windows, they do have menus, things you can click because the world has come up with more user friendly interfaces to Linux. But you'll get your hands dirty this semester with some of the building blocks because frankly, when you get comfortable with this stuff, you can do so much more, so much more easily. And so So much more efficiently just by telling the computer precisely what you want. So, CD we saw. CP, any guess? CP sounds copy. It's kind of the shorthand version of copy. And in fact, it is. CP we'll use to copy code this semester. LS is list. MKDIR is,、um, is make directory. MV, move. So, that's synonymous with, we'll see, renaming a file. So, to rename a file, you'll say MV space the original name space the new name. Not terribly hard. PWD. Yeah, so print working directory. What this means here is I'm back on the nice.fas server. If I kind of get a little confused sometime and I type PWD, it will tell me the full path. 
to where I am on the server. So right now I'm logged in as Malin, and Malin does not have access to everything on the server because there's like 20,000 plus other people with FAS accounts. So in fact, FAS took the approach years ago, very intelligently, of organizing things hierarchically. So notice there's a directory. The root of the hard drive is apparently has a directory in it called NFS, Network File System. Home, which is where everyone's home directories live. And a home directory is just your personal storage space. M slash A just looks like there's a whole hierarchy of names there to keep things clean. Slash CS50, this is the full path to where I am. And realize that I can definitely go poking around if I get curious. This is not a bad thing.、Uh, if I type CD dot dot, it doesn't go this way, it goes backwards, so to speak, or higher up in this tree. So now notice I'm back in my so called home directory. Where am I going to be if I do it once more? Yeah, the director called A. So, with all of the people whose names, usernames start with MA, which if I do CD, it's getting a little curious here.、Uh, maybe,、uh, hmm, will this backfire? Maybe if we could put the camera down here for just a moment so that we're not podcasting this to the internet. These are all of the people on fas.harvard.edu whose names, sorry, folks at home can't see this, that begin with MA. If we go back one more directory, keep the camera underwhelming、uh, down here, there's the whole alphabet. We can see people who start with With probably no MZs, I'm guessing. Whoops, CDZ, LS. Oh, there are. Oh, M. Okay, so it's not a full name, it's first letter of the first name, last name. So again, you can poke around all you want and see a whole bunch of stuff on this computer. But Linux, like most operating systems, has various permissions and fancy control features, so you really can't do bad things. You can't access, for instance, if I get nosy, let's say、uh, home slash A slash Y, IDA for Jansu's home directory. So, oops, let me. Is that her?、Uh, oh, I'm forgetting the D. Oh, ooh, so I'm in it. <laughs> Let's. Thankfully, permission denied. So things are in fact configured correctly. So, again, just random little trivia that ultimately gets useful because just understanding the world in which you're playing, I think, lets you get yourself out of problems and actually solve more interesting ones. So, there are some other commands that we'll see. And again, every PSET PDF will walk you through any of this minutia. You're not going to have to figure it out or think back from week one what the heck was the command for this. So, we're going to see things like GCC, as we've already, GDB, commands like、uh, more, and then someone Got clever. More is just a program that shows you the contents of a file. Well, someone wanted to be clever and kind of one up that person, so they called their program less, but it does really the same thing.、Um, man for manual, which is something you'll get familiar with as well. So, what does it take to write a program? So, it's three steps, and we've done it twice. Last week in this, one, open up a text editor like Nano in a Linux environment and call the file whatever, hi1.c or hello1.c using the .c convention for namesake. GCC, the name of the file, and then you run the thing by simply writing,、uh, running the default name. Well, what if we want to do something more interesting? Give it a non stupid name like a.out. So there are again these things called command line arguments or switches with which you can control the behavior of code、uh, more interestingly. So if I go back over here into my CS50 account, Uh, my CS50 directory. Here's hello.c. My goal now is to create a more interesting name than a.out. So, per that previous slide, I say dash o for output. Let's call the program hello. And then let's say compile this particular program. Okay, ls. Now I have a binary, zeros and ones called hello.、Oh, so, notice I. You'll notice little、uh, keystrokes、uh, that save you time. If you hit tab, it will do autocomplete, which saves you time. Unfortunately, it also reveals all the other commands on the server that start with he, in this case, head, hello, help desk, help desk server, help z tags, and hex dump, none of which I care about. So, hel hello, enter. Same exact program, even though it's called something different still. So, more interesting, but again, just a fundamentally uninteresting building block. But your programs are going to get more complicated over time. You know, most of your programs by semester's end are not going to be you know, this big in a simple text file. They're going to be multiple files. And they're not going to be terribly long each, but we'll see one of the principles we'll preach in the course is design and good design. And as some of you may have experienced in Scratch already, If you're implementing a script that's kind of this big, and then you add some more features, and then it's this big, and then this big, and this big, and God forbid, this wide and wide and wide, because you keep adding ifs and ifs and ifs and ifs and ifs, so you're probably crossing the boundary at some point of what we'd call good design. If you're scrolling up, down, left, right just to see your own program, there's probably a better approach. Now, for PSET Zero, you don't need to worry so much about this, because we haven't really told you what good design is, but among the features will be 
chopping up your code into much more manageable, bite-sized pieces, putting it in separate files, putting it in scratch in separate scripts. And you'll see that a command that will facilitate this is called make. So you'll see both of these approaches in pset1, simply typing make and then the name of the program you want to make. In this case, hello. Notice I'm not typing .c. I'm saying make hello. Make is a program that's going to infer, well, if this guy wanted to make a program called make, it's probably based on a file called make.c. So if I hit enter, huh, it tried to recompile it, but it realized, and this is what's cool about make, it realized, oh, you haven't changed the program. Why should I waste my time regenerating identical zeros and ones? So in fact, it didn't bother. But if I do ls to see my files, how do I remove hello and a dot out? Yeah, rm, hello, enter. It's going to ask for a sanity check. Remove regular file, hello, question mark. Yes. rm, a dot out. Yes for that too. So now I just have my source code, make, hello, enter. So the command's going to look a little more cryptic because we, just to get you started at term start, are configuring these accounts in a way that just makes some things easier. And we'll take those training wheels off over time, but it achieved the same result because, in fact, I now have a program called hello in that directory as well. So what are these programs you can use? So Nano is by far the simplest editor you can use, at least at term start. Uh, apparently on my computer it doesn't support the delete feature, but we will fix that um, so that you don't need to um, fail the very first time you make a program like I did. But there are other tools out there. Those of you might know programs like Vim, and in fact most of the time I'll use a program called Vim just because that's what I was taught in CS50 years ago. I kind of grew up on it. Emacs is another popular one. But more on this in the future. I mention it now only so that you don't get confused or puzzled when you see this TF use this program, this TF use another. It's just like using Pages versus Microsoft Word versus WordPad. It's all the same kind of stuff in this world as well. So in a moment, we're going to actually tease apart what it means to write a more interesting program than Hello World. The basic building block for almost any C program is going to start with this construct here. But why don't we go ahead, since this was a lot to digest, and take a five minute break first? All right, we are back. So, Yuki and Jansu inform me that sectioning will indeed debut this evening. Go to cs50.net, take a look at the, any instructions you'll find on the home page, check around midnight or certainly by morning.、Um, and note this so, per last week's announcements and the syllabus, we do offer three tracks of sections, just like First Nights does for our students who are more and less comfortable with music. So, do we do the same with just the idea of being in CS50? So, there's no steadfast rule as to what makes you less comfortable, what makes you more comfortable, and what makes you Somewhere in between. To be honest, it's a term you can probably just slap on yourself based on just how comfortable you actually are having returned this week to CS50.、Um, you've seen what the percentage breakdowns are, so we get plenty of folks from each of the buckets. So when you use FAS's sectioning tool, realize that because we have these three different types of sections, you're going to see a long list of about 30 sections. Since we have about 30 teaching fellows and thus 30 sections, and in the comments field of the sectioning program, you'll see if that section slot has been designated for those more comfortable, those less, or those somewhere. Somewhere in between. If you're on the fence as to where you belong, you cannot go wrong being in the somewhere in between section. That's really for folks who just don't feel themselves at either extreme. But certainly feel free to chat with me or any of the TFs if you're curious as to what this all means or where you belong. Now, what does this mean in real terms for sections? Frankly, it just means that, especially for those less comfortable, it just means you're going to be in,、uh, in a room full of people who feel as apprehensive or as inexperienced as you. And it's sort of a, a safer space in which to put up your hand and ask the question you think is the proverbial dumb question. The sections for those more comfortable are meant to digress intentionally from, say, the course's syllabus, from the week's problem set, and really go off in any interesting technical direction that some of the savvier students might like to explore, even though it's not going to help them per se on that particular week's problem set. But again, if you don't feel yourself needing that sort of comfort zone here, or you don't really think that you'd want to try holding your own with some of those more comfortable, then the sweet spot, just like the standard editions for most students, is that for those somewhere in between. All right, so let's do something a little more interesting now. I've gone ahead and, per the handout you have, I have a whole bunch of code already in this account. So I'm going to go back to my screen here, and you'll see again commands like this on PSETs. What I'm going to do for a moment is copy uh, uh, tilde CS50. So, henceforth, the tilde character, which on most US keyboards is on the top left near the escape key, tilde CS50 means go into CS50's home directory. Now, I'm in Malin's home directory at the moment, so go into CS50's, 
just like I try to with IDA's home directory. So go into CS50s, and then I know because I'm reading this off of a PDF or whatever that there's a pub directory, that there's a source, SRC, again, nicknames in Linux, source directory, and then I know there's a lectures directory in there, and then we're in week one. So it turns out there is, in fact, a directory called one inside of lectures, inside of source, inside of pub, inside of CS50's home directory, and my goal is to copy it from there to here because I, now a student in the class, decide that I want to push ahead. I want to do this after class and play around. I want to copy David's source code into my own account just so I can play perfectly fine. Notice that dot. Represents this directory just as dot dot represents the parent directory. So if I hit enter, this is actually flawed. Notice that something bad happened, and if I type ls, I didn't get any files. So realize too, a, a sort of FAQ early on is if you want to copy a directory with CP, you need to do it recursively, which is a keyword that we'll revisit in the term. It means to do it not only to that directory, but all the files inside and all the subdirectories inside again and again and again until you bottom out. So CP R means copy the following recursively into my current directory, enter. Took a second because there are, in fact, a bunch of files. In fact, if I go into my one directory now, here are some examples that I pre prepared so that we can go off in a, a known direction here. So, one direction we already went in was hi1.c. But your version on paper looks a little different from the quick and dirty thing I've been whipping up. There's a lot more purple on the screen here. So, all the stuff at top. Is fundamentally irrelevant to the computer, but just like Scratch does, if you've discovered it yet, lets you put little comments here and there, sort of sticky notes, so to speak, post it notes. So does C in most any high level language. And by high level language, henceforth, I mean something that's not zeros and ones, not something called assembly language. It means ignore all of the following. This is useful only to me, the human. So in C, the means by which you write a comment is to do a forward slash star. And that means anything after that on this line or below will be ignored by the compiler, GCC, and the comment stops when you hit the opposite of that, star slash. So the fact that I actually have all of these stars and I've kind of boxed things in is really just some OCD on my part. It's nothing technical. I just wanted to make a nice pretty purple box to box in all of my code. But one key takeaway is that I made sure that this line of, a of stars and the slashes does not exceed the width of my window. So another lesson that's important early on is to make sure the code you start writing is Pretty printed. And this just means it actually displays nicely on a typical window. In real terms, this means you should never, at least for the C part of this course, have a line of text that is longer than 80 characters long. And even that's pushing it. 76 is kind of the geek's rule of thumb as to how long a line should be. How do you know what's 76 or what's 80 characters? Well, right now, my window. Has essentially been expanded to be、uh, as long as I wanted it to be, but you get into the habit of knowing when to hit enter to move things onto the next line. And Nano and programs like it will actually force you to in,、uh, will force your lines to wrap if they start to get long. And this is just a matter of good style because, as you could imagine, if I wrote my whole program on just one line, it would still work. The computer would not care, but you, the humans, probably would. In fact, this is hi1.c. Let me go ahead and delete all that stuff. I'm going to go ahead and do this. You know, this、uh, really don't need that there. Let me go ahead and put that there. Right? If I had given you a printout of this, I mean, rightly so, would things start to look pretty damn complicated? Now, some of these spaces are important so that you can distinguish what's int and what's argc. But if I go ahead and save this with Control X, hit Y, and now go ahead and run GCC of hi1.c. Program thankfully still compiles. I still have a dot out, so it still works this version, but it's certainly not very pretty printed and not very legible. So what else is inside of this file? Well, hmm, I didn't really want to do that. Let me go ahead and go back into CS50 pub source lectures one. Let me just get a new copy of this. So now it's going to prompt me. Wait a minute. Overwrite hi one dot c. Little sanity check. Say yes. So now I have the prettier version back. I'm going to start using a program called vi or vim just because. Frankly, I'm more comfortable with it than Nano, even though Nano is simpler.、Uh, do as I say, not as I do.、Uh, Hi1.c still kind of pretty prints everything and color codes it. And the color is actually a feature that you don't get if you try writing your first programs with Notepad.exe、uh, or other similar client side programs. It's just making some inferences about the different roles that some of these keywords play. So I didn't write the word int in green. I didn't write the word char in green. It just knows that that represents the type of a variable. Let me draw David's attention to it with this default color scheme. So what's interesting here? Well, this stuff at the top. 
is all comments. And actually, now we get to use fun little toy. This stuff up here is all comments. All right, so it's fundamentally irrelevant, but useful for documenting your code. This thing here, I'm going to briefly call today a preprocessor directive, which is just a fancy way of saying, tell the compiler to go get the contents of some other file that often someone else wrote. So, what we don't have here is any kind of specification of what printf does. Like, who wrote printf? I wrote this program called main, but who wrote printf, right? I'm kind of cutting corners here. Well, it turns out that when Linux Shipped with this compiler, someone else, some really smart people, spent a lot of time getting this very basic, important function implemented in their own source code. So by saying sharp include, open angled bracket, standard IO.h, close bracket, that's just telling GCC, you know what, the following code has some functions, some programs that other people wrote. Those programs happen to be inside of a file called standard IO.h. Please go grab the contents. Paste them in here so that I don't have to do it myself. So, in real terms, I'm kind of oversimplifying there because, in real terms, what we're using here is a library. So, a library of code, henceforth, is just a bunch of code that someone else wrote, or maybe you wrote, but that you factored out into separate files so that you don't have to copy and paste it into every future program you write. So, technically, my white lie I just told is that these programs, printf, these functions, actually, as they should really be called, Are not actually in that file, standard io.h. Inside of that file, we'll eventually see is just a minimal amount of information, essentially a summary of all of the functions in that file. Because as you might imagine, where is the actual implementation, the actual lines of code that implement printf? What would the file name probably be called? Standard io.c. So, in fact, yeah, there is a file out somewhere on the system called standard io.c that someone else implemented, but there's a lot of lines of code in there. A normal human doesn't want to read through it. So, we have these header files, which are called .h files, and then C files, which have actual code. And initially, I'm not making any header files myself. We'll get to that eventually. But just realize some of these minor tripping points early on are just about keeping programs relatively clean. So, this, to be short,、uh, simply says go get the contents of this file so that I can use functions like printf. And henceforth, let me clarify. So, I am writing a program. This program is arbitrarily going to be called、uh, hello, but I can override that we, as we've seen with the dash o flag for GCC. So, programs are made up of functions, one or more functions. And these are kind of like miniature programs, just like your Scratch projects are probably made up of multiple scripts. A script is a function. So, a function is just a piece of code that does something. And as you can have multiple scripts in Scratch, you can have multiple functions in C. And just as The default、uh, block or script in Scratch is that thing called when green flag clicked. So in C is the default script, the default function called main. Now, why, if it's just called main, do I need to write something like int and then int and argc, char, or this asterisk, this argv, this bracket notation? There's just a lot of crap at the beginning of a program when you're writing it in C. Those of you who took AP Computer Science know that there's class, foo,、uh, public static, void, main. It's even worse in Java. And frankly, this is just because these languages were not designed with. Week zero of a programming class in mind. So, again, it's stupid stuff. You get past it quickly. For today, we're going to wave our hands at details like that. But to say, for now, it's a copy paste thing. To start writing a function, you literally write int, main, and all the rest of that stuff. But then the fun part, or at least the intellectually interesting part, happens in between the curly braces for now. So, that's how I would go about printing this simple program. Let me actually take a look at a more interesting version, though only slightly. Called hi2.c. And again, you have a printout of this. So, what's the fundamental difference between version one and this one, version two? Hopefully, it jumps out at you. Right. So, yeah, so if a bit egotistically, this jumps out at you that this program has my name immortalized in it. But how did I do this? Well, it looks like I've got this additional line. So, David is mentioned, but what's going on? Well, even just using the jargon I started using earlier, string, because it comes before the name of a variable, means what precisely? Yeah, it's the type of variable. So the variable is called name. What's going to be inside of this variable? Well, it's not going to be an int, because David is not an int. It's, it's a string, it's a word, it's a sentence. So I'm going to specify that the type of this variable is string. Now, the equal sign, again, is the assignment operator. It means put the value of the thing on the right inside the thing on the left. So the value on the right is itself a string. And in C, as in many languages, if you want to have a literal、uh, sequence of characters be treated as one unit, you put them in. 
in、uh, all double quotes. You can use single quotes, but only around single characters. So, those of you who know a little bit of HTML probably know it doesn't matter if you use single or double. It does matter in many programming languages, including C. So, strings are double quotes. All right, then what do I do on the second line? Well, we've not quite seen this syntax, but in layman's term, can someone explain what the percent %s there represents? String, right? Really not that hard. Percent %d happened to represent int. Percent %s represents string. And so the thing after the comma means what do you want to substitute in for that formatting code? The percent %s? Put the name of the variable. All right. So more interesting. So gcc hi2.c, enter. Now I'm going to run a.out. OK, oh, hi, David. But unfortunately, Right? It's really not that interesting if your program is completely deterministic and always spits out the same result, because really, I mean, there are so many easier ways to just say something like this than all the, this setup. So let's take a look at the third version of this, which is a little more interesting. And finally, we get a compelling use for a keyboard. So this program differs, per the comments up top, in that there's a third line of code here that uses a new function. So we've been using printf to send output. Turns out that you can also. Nicely enough, get input from a user. So, not by way of the mouse, at least in this context, but by way of the keyboard. And what's the new function? Just to take an obvious guess here. Get string. Right? As the name implies, the function get strings, purpose in life is to get a string from the user and do what with the result, apparently? Store it. So, functions we now see right away have this ability not only to do something aesthetically, printf has this so called side effect of displaying something on the screen, but functions can also return a value. So, you can think of a function kind of as a black box that does some work, but can then maybe hand you some answer, and it's up to you, the programmer, to decide if you're going to do anything with that answer. How do you do something with it? Well, one of the things you could do is keep the answer around. So, by having string name on the left that says, Give me a variable called name. It's of type string. What are you going to put inside of it? Well, whatever the result is, the return value, so to speak, of the thing on the right. So get string returns now a value. How does this all behave in reality? So GCC、uh, hi3.c. I'm getting a little tired of a.out. How do I give this a better name? Yeah, so dash o for,、uh, for output, and then let's call it hi3, though I could call it anything I want. Uh oh. Did I create a problem there? Kind of a coincidence, right? So, still the same error. Yeah, so, so correct. Fancy correct answer. So, there's a problem here in that getString is a function, yes, but it wasn't written by the original authors of the C programming language. In fact, just getting input from the user in C is really a pain. You have to use a function, among others, called scanf, and we'll use this eventually. There's other tricks too. But, long story short, in week one of a course, especially this course, it's a complete、uh, bunch of hurdles you have to jump through to do something as simple as get a character from the keyboard, even in Java. Those of you familiar with the scanner, Class, even that is a pain to actually use, I'd say, on week,、uh, in the first week of a class. So, notice what did I do in this file? I did one other thing besides mention get string. There's one other key difference outside of the comments. What else is new here? Yeah, so I'm not just using the standard I.O. library. It turns out that the CS50 staff a few years ago wrote our own library. And we wrote what that means two files, one called CS50.h, one called CS50.c. In the latter, we wrote a bunch of functions that we thought would be useful to students this semester, namely get int and get string and silly name, but get long long and other functions still that really simplify the process, at least at the start of the semester, of getting keyboard input from users. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, it's not sufficient just to tell GCC, hey, make sure you go get a copy of the header file for CS50's library so I know that these functions exist, because I've done that. So, one mistake might have been. To omit this line together, that would in fact be bad, but that's not the only mistake I made. I now need to tell CS50's library when you compile this, you don't just get away with turning one file, hi3.c, into zeros and ones, because you need access to one other file called what? 
Yeah, so CS50.C, so there's a couple solutions here. I could email the course staff and it could say, hey, can I have a copy of CS50.C? We're well, happy to give it because there's no intellectual property there. It's just san standard C stuff. But that seems kind of wasteful if every time this semester you write a program, you need to copy our file, put it in your own directory, kind of bloat your own code. Well, in fact, there's an easier way. You can tell GCC to link against, L-I-N-K, link against our library. And long story short, what this means is that when GCC is converting high 3.0, C from source code into object code, from human readable to zeros and ones, it means, oh, by the way, go get the library, dash L, called CS50 and merge the two at the very last minute so that the file you get out, hi3 or a.out, contains zeros and ones from both of those files. So again, another silly detail that's very easy for, to forget, but just to kind of drill it into your minds, if you ever see this semester a message about undefined references, probably means you forgot something simple like the library that you wanted to use, dash LCS50. There's others. Dash LM gives you a math library. There's dash L crypt, which gives you a cryptography library and stuff like that. But it did work this time. When I said go ahead and link in this file, I did in fact get hi3. So if I run hi3, state your name, uh, we'll say Jansu. Oh, hi Jansu. How about Yuki? Okay, so now I have still kind of overwhelming, right? Not, not anything to write home about, but at least it's a dynamic program that's starting to do a little bit more. So just to give you a sense now of some formalities, one I've used here, printf a couple of times. I've used it pretty simply to use things like strings and ints, but we can do more powerful things with it. And in fact, you'll have to get used to sort of a new sort of uh, world where people write things somewhat cryptically sometimes. This is an excerpt from the man page, the manual page for printf. And the way you, the programmer, know how to use a function is often, frankly, by RTFM. Just read the manual and actually look up what the instructions are. Google it later if you'd like, uh, for those less comfortable and unfamiliar with the speak. Um, so what you'll find on the course's website throughout the semester under resources, we have a bunch of links we think you'll find useful. One of them is to this wonderful site called cppreference.com, the only downside of which CPP means C++. So the author of the site actually made it fairly C++ specific. So under resources on the course's website, we have our own copy of this website because he open sourced it to everyone. So if I actually go to cs50.net slash resources, what you'll see up here under the link to see is a bunch of things, most of which we won't need just yet. But if I go to uh, C reference, this is a wonderfully useful site. And this is one of the reasons that you don't really need a book for a course like this, because so much stuff, is, so much good stuff is available online. If I know that I'm doing something with I.O., that sounds cryptic, but just means input, output, print, get, stuff like that. Notice if I scroll down here, clearly we're only scratching the surface today of what C can do, but I was interested in what printf can do. And here's just fairly user-friendly documentation of the other codes you can use. So we saw already, uh, let's see, percent %d, and there it is at the top for signed integers, things that may or may not have a negative sign in front, percent %s for a string of characters. But there's some other stuff here, too, that we may or may not use during the semester. But what's nice about this site is it gives you sample code. It tells you what library, what header file you must include at the top of your program. And then it tells you what the function's signature is. That is, what is sort of the canonical form of this thing so you can begin to understand how you use it. And again, you'll get much more acclimated to this over the course of the semester. But we can do more interesting things with this. So just as there's backslash n for new line, there's backslash r for carriage return. So if you think back to retro typewriters, not, when you hit enter on an old fashioned typewriter, not only did the paper move this way, the little uh, head re typing head moved this way. So a carriage return moves the cursor all the way back to the left. A new line moves it down one line. So this is another sort of stupid thing from uh, religious battles past. So in the Windows world, most text files end with what's called a carriage return and a line feed, C-R-L-F, which means backslash R, backslash N. In the Linux world, people were much more conservative. They just used new lines. And backslash N in many systems, Macs and uh, Actually, that's not so much Mac sometimes. So in Linux computers, backslash n means yes, go to the next line and go all the way to the left. So I'm just kind of grimacing at some of these details because, again, these things too are little things you trip over early on. They're fundamentally not that interesting, but you get used to little trivia or minutia like this. But this does beg the question, if backslash n means new line, backslash r means uh, uh, carriage return, how do you just write a literal backslash? Well, the answer's there, but this is a common pattern. What is it? 
backslash backslash. So unfortunately, a little weird. You kind of have to have a corner case like that. If you want a literal backslash in a string, you escape the backslash. But this notion of escaping is something we'll see quite a bit. Well, it turns out we can do stuff with not just ints, not just strings. There are chars for individual characters, doubles for floating point values, and float for floating point values. And all of these have some different meaning. In fact, let me go ahead to an example that's not just text based now, but just to demonstrate, again, to underwhelm at first, because we can definitely want up ourselves easily that math is not hard in C. So here's a program that assigns a variable called x of type integer the value of 1, semicolon. A, value, a variable called y, type of is int, assign it a value of 2. Right? New syntax, not interesting. Finally, I declare a third variable called z. It also is going to store an int. It's going to store the sum of x and y. Looks pretty good. So let me go ahead and run gcc of math1.c. OK, interesting. So it turns out GCC, especially the way we have it configured on nice.fas, can also be a bit anal and a little, and a little cautious on your behalf, saying, you know what? Odds are you screwed up here, right? It's saying it very nicely, warning unused variable z. But that's telling you that you did something, you're not using it, probably wasn't a very productive program you just wrote. So, but let's try it. Let's be stubborn and let's run a.out, enter. Is it not working? It's actually working perfectly. Right? The math is correct. What is in Z at this point? Oh, missed it. This, the, the problem is what? Simple answer. Right, I'm not like, doing anything with it. Yes, I've created three variables. All of them at some point in time do in fact have numbers like 1, 2, and hopefully 3 inside of them. But if you don't do anything with it, sort of the tree falling in the woods, right? No one knows that the answer you just computed was 3 unless you print it, save it, uh, do something with it. So hopefully there's a solution here. So let's take a look at the second slightly fixed version of this. So how do I print out the result? Well, again, let's just go into our little toolkit that's going to start being filled with more functions still. Printf, quote unquote, quotes, the quotes are important, the percent %d means display this as an integer, and then I pass in z, and so OK. So now not only have I written a correct program, I'm actually doing something productive with it, a.out, now gives, hmm, still a little weird. It's not incorrect, but what's the explanation for this weirdness? Right, so there's just no new line. So let me go in here, and I'm going to move over here, add between the quotes, but after the percent %d, backslash n. Let me recompile another little Linux trick. If you get tired of typing the same commands over and over again, you can either hit up and that will scroll through the commands you've previously typed, or you can hit exclamation point, aka bang, and type the first letter or so of the last command that you type that starts with that sequence and hit enter. And if I haven't forgotten some other G command I wrote, it should remember, aha, it was GCC math2.c. Again, little things you pick up over time. And if I run a dot out, OK, slightly prettier, slightly prettier. So what else can we do here? Well, there's going to be other data types still, but there's also these format strings. So let's see if we can't do a little bit of something that's more interesting underneath the hood. So it turns out we have format strings, but there's also this approach here. Let me go back to the code. This is a program, again, that you have a printout of called size of. And here's where we finally scratch the surface of actual design issues, actual questions that are interesting to answer, because they really be affect the correctness of your program and what you can do with it. So this program, it's not very long. It's about half comments and half actual code. Notice that at the top here, I've declared some variables in advance. So this is kind of interesting. Even though thus far, I've very efficiently, very anally been declaring a variable on the left and then doing something with it on the right, all in one line. You don't need to do that. If you know you're going to need a variable, you can declare the variable earlier in your program and then use it later. And you'll learn over time when, and w when this is and isn't appropriate. But here I've declared three types of values, a char, a double, a float, and an int. A float is a floating point value, a real number, something with a decimal point. Uh, what's a double, perhaps? Any ideas? So it's twice something. It's actually a floating point value that's twice as big, potentially. So it turns out that in this language and in some others, there are actually predefined meanings for how many bits are used to represent a data type. So we have chars are eight bits on a typical modern computer with Intel inside. A double is, hmm, let's come back to that, a float is 32 bits. Now that's pretty big. Right? Because if an int is also 32 bits, what did we say last week the biggest number you can represent with 32 bits is? 
It's like 4 billion. Now, wait a minute, if you're omitting negative numbers. So if it's negative numbers also, then it's like two, negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion, roughly, but a total of 4 billion. So floating point values also use 32 bits, but they use them to have some、uh, numbers before the decimal point, some after. So you can't, it's a trade off between how big a number you can represent as a floating point value versus how many points you can have after the decimal point. But a double now is not 32 bits, right? I'm kind of beyond the scope of my. my My、arms here is 64 bits, and that's pretty damn big. So you'll have some discretion there. So, what does it mean when I run this down here? Print F char, percent DN. All right, so print an int and a new line. But what do you want to print? Well, there's this operator in C that's only occasionally useful. Today it's my,、uh, marginally enlightening. Tell me the size of the variable C. Tell me the size of the variable D, F, and I. So let me go ahead and run a GCC on size of dot C. Now I'm going to go ahead and run A dot out. And wait a minute. So, this is not, in fact, values like 32 and 64. What am I seeing? Yeah, I'm seeing bytes. That's kind of interesting. OK, a y so that's fine. Let me take a look at one other thing. I saw on the screen a moment ago that there's this mention of longs. So, let me say long is an L. And let me print out its length here. So, long, and I think it's L, hopefully, percent.、Uh, let's see, GCC, size of C. Oops, not L, damn it.、Uh, What is it? Is it also D? Yes. All right. If I run this now, what do you think a long is going to be? So int was four. It's also four. So again, sort of a historical artifact. When I mentioned long longs before, so if you want an int that's bigger than 32 bits, you want a 64 bit int, it's not a long, because a long is the same as an int. It's a long long that you want. So again, sort of random.、Uh, C trivia. But I thought we'd end with this. Here's a crazy looking program. I downloaded this off the internet, written by a really, either really brilliant person or a person with really a lot of free time. So, this is an obfuscated C program. And you are entering a community that you don't have to stay in in perpetuity of people who like writing programs like this or have the ability to do it. And there are contests that people run for obfuscated C contests, whereby you challenge people to write the most confusing looking program you could possibly come up with that no human should be able to understand. And then you challenge the audience, the other geeks in the room, what that program actually does. Do you have any idea? What this is going to do, we will not be writing things like this. This is an exercise in the opposite of good design, but it's kind of a powerful thing that if we run the compiler here, the warnings I'm going to ignore for now, that's fine. A dot out. I give you the results of your first obfuscated C program, which is. <laughs> that's what that does. We'll see you on Friday.